This is South Jersey's talk station, WPG Talk Radio 95.5. And a happy new year to all. Hey, you're inside Rack and Fin Radio with me, Tom P. Weekend of May 18th and 19th. Now in a parallel universe of Rack and Fin Radio when a new season opens. Indeed, cause for a new year's celebration. Well, yesterday, the first portion of the Black Sea Bass open. It's going to run through June 19th. 10 fish limit, 12.5 inch minimum. That's going to be the thrust of the program today. Joining us in our next couple of segments is Peter Clark, biologist, Bureau of Marine Fisheries. We're going to be talking sea bass biology, some sea bass tactics, and some hot reefs because Peter's also the artificial reef coordinator, state of New Jersey. And a little later in the show will be Chris Gatley, Mustad Fishing. We're going to be talking the slow pitch game. Just a couple of announcements. Oh, I'll tell you. There's still plenty of trout out there. Morris River and check out Ponder Lodge Pond. Stocking stopped, uh, what, uh, down south here, what, a week or so, a couple weeks ago. So, again, there's still plenty of fish out there. Bass, pickerel, as steady as ever. Oh, this weather, man, has been really, really funky. And it does not, I'll tell you, it does not bode well, this wet, chilly weather we're having for those new little uh, hatched wild turkey chicks. Man, who knows what the nesting success is going to be like next year if this keeps up. And just a reminder before we get into the meat of the show, the seasonal closures on five wildlife management areas in effect May 23rd through September 2nd. Yeah, because uh, closed because of illegal swimming, illegal parking, and any other violations. There's been a lot of litter out there. It's crazy, and they're not sportsmen doing it, people, but fish and wildlife, evidently they have no alternative. These are the uh, closure maps. Go to Wildlife Management Area Explorer app. You'll find it in Cedar Lake Wildlife Management Area, the Sand Plant Area, Greenwood Forest, Greenwood Forest Wildlife Management Area, the Parker's Pit Area, and the Clay Holes Area. Monatico Ponds Wildlife Management Area, Area 1, Area 2, and Area 3. Now, those from Monatico Ponds have changed from previous years. See the newest closure. Get to that map. Uh, Wildcat Ridge up there in North Jersey. It's Split Rock Reservoir. That's that's always a mess in the summer, man. And the Winslow Wildlife Management Area, the Winslow East Hot Mix section. So that's it. Hey, man, grab that cup, grab that rebel. Let's talk sea bass. Be right back. Rack and Hey, also, also, hey, good luck to anyone participating in tomorrow's Governor's Surf Tournament up there at Island Beach State Park. I guess you can still uh, still register if you show up. Go to njfishandwildlife.com. Check out the information. Man, there's some blues running along the beach now. Still some stripes around them. Here and again now. A little bit of a gap there. The bad weather, heavy seas. Kingfish are showing up. And, man, except for maybe ooh, triggerfish, sea bass, that is about the best eaten in close fish. Grab that cup, grab that rebel. We'll be right back. Rack and Fin Radio. It's sea bass time. Rack and Fin Radio with Tom P. WPG Talk Radio 95.5. South Jersey's talk station. WPG Talk Radio 95.5. A one day late belated happy new year to all. The opening of the sea bass season yesterday, Friday the 17th. Okay, here is the dealio. It's going to run till June 19th. 12.5 inches, excluding the tail filaments, which to me, they're a part of the fish. They should be included. But. We could never get an answer on that. And the limit is 10 fish. As promised several weeks ago, we were talking fluke. It is the return of P- Peter Clark. I was going to call him the Admiral. That's a, that's a off the off the record reference to this incredible fisherman. He is also marine biologist, DEP's Bureau of Marine Fisheries, and coordinator of the New Jersey Artificial Reef Project, the finest of its kind on the planet. We're talking sea bass with Captain Peter Clark. He knows his bass biologically and how to catch these basses. How you doing, Admiral? I'm good. How you doing, Tom? And sea bass, man, we're open today. Did those three, two or three weeks fly or what, Cap? You ready? You rocking yeah, or what? It was a quick one. Yep. Yeah, it's good, man. There's sea bass everywhere. Everywhere, Tom. Great. Yeah, I'm talk- I spoke with probably went to, uh, probably seven or eight party boat captains, big boats, up and down. They can't, they couldn't get the baits down to the fluke or the ling or even some of the cod that are down there because of the sea bass just swarming. Yeah, one guy says, it, one, I'll never, he says, I've been in this business 30 years. I've never seen, readings and everything, I've never seen this many sea bass. A lot of catch and release going on the past two weeks. The guys are going crazy. Yeah. Well, now that we're open, right, 
So sea bass literally from the beaches out to the 30 line. Uh, there's, there's sea bass everywhere. You don't have to go very far for them, which is great. Uh, yeah, I mean, shaping up for a great, great opening season here. Now, Pete, we're talking uh, these few weeks, and it closes, listeners, for uh, the month of June, July 1st to August 30th. So it goes down to one fish. Pete, before we get yeah. to the nuances, explain the drop from two to one and what it allowed uh, in the fall fishery go. Yeah, so we had to take a slight reduction, um, and and that's where we ended up taking it, right? So we we had, had to end up taking that. Uh, we went, well, we were we were open at two fish a, a couple of years ago. Now we're at that one fish, so it still gives us that, you know, that that bycatch, if you will, sure. while we're fluking uh, during July and August. But of course, October one, it's you know, kapow, back bang, yep. fish, twelve and a half inches. And that and that's a fantastic aspect of, of this year, right? So we have the ability now to really, you know, you know, just crank on them ten fish, twelve and a half inches until November, where we go back to fifteen fish. Right? There you go, fifteen. That and that and and we all know that's like the offshore, right? We're, you're you're traveling forty, fifty or more miles, hitting some of those deep hundred and eighty, two hundred foot wrecks. Yep. Um, big big knuckleheads out there. Just slammers, you know. Um, but I'll tell you what, it, you, you need to get out now, right? This is now, when now, now. Big in flux, <laughs> right now, <laughs> right now. Get it, yeah. Um, we have a huge influx of these of large fish coming in, and uh, yeah, they're like I said, I, and I'm not, you know, you mentioned the party boat guys are you're, they're getting bait stripped, they can't get to the bottom. Right, it, yeah, it, it's true. They are, they are. Everywhere, man. Everywhere. So, Pete, the stocks are, for lack of a better term, safe, correct? They're thriving, correct? Yeah, I mean, I would even say they're they're stellar, right? So we're, we have a target biomass, and we're 200, 220% over that target right now. I, uh, so, so more than double, right? Our target is more than double, and that's a good thing. It means that there's a lot of sea bass around. There's no lack or shortage of them. Um, you know, one of the reasons we see these reductions in, in in our measures is because we're so successful at harvesting them. So if we have a biomass target, and then there's, we have a lot of different targets, as you well know. Right. Uh, our harvest target is also a static number. Um, and when we when we exceed that, the previous year, so last year, if we exceed that or if we exceed it this year, then we have to take a slight reduction the following year. Now, we, we know that we're now using uh, the recreational demand model through the percent change approach. These are all new concepts that were, were, um, were introduced a couple of years ago with the Atlantic States Marine Fisheries Commission and the Mid-Atlantic Council. And so instead of taking these giant reductions of 40% or whatever, it's, you know, a 10% reduction, 10% liberalization, things like that. So right. it's a, less of a, a swing on what we, you know, what we have to do. Peter, to the biology of the sea bass, the black sea bass. Now they're, they all start out female or male and whichever. And then when is the transition MP? When is their first spawn? Right. So, yeah, and, that, and that's a great question. So they start it's about 80 percentish, somewhere in that neighborhood, 80, 82 percent all start as females. And um, depending on that local school that, you know, that that local abundance, um, some of the males will tra or so, I'm sorry, some of those females, some of that 82 percent will transition to males. For spawning, they usually spawn around three years uh, of age, three or four years of age. They'll start spawning in the spring, and um, that's right around. I, I talk in millimeters. It's like 180 to 220 millimeters, which is probably about I don't know eight inches or so okay. in that neighborhood. Uh, yeah, so we give them a few years to spawn without Bingo. any kind of interruption, right? Yeah, that's a question, right? I, yep. Yep. So they they get into that. They we we want them to spawn for a few years before we start harvesting them, uh, either uh, recreationally, like we're talking about, commercially, um, which is the same size limit, twelve and a half inches, and uh, you know we give them an opportunity to really blast out some eggs and uh, replenish that that biomass. 
Joining us on the Rack and Fin line this morning is Peter Clark, biologist, New Jersey Bureau of Marine Fisheries. Talking sea bass and the prospectus for the season. Talking a little biology here. So, Peter, now the harvest figures at these numbers, uh, pretty steady. So, theoretically, we're not going to be looking at any great reductions. Now, I'm not putting you on the spot, but in the near future, like yeah. next year, things look pretty, pretty copacetic. Yeah, I mean, theoretically, if we maintain our harvest, if we're able able to constrain our harvest, uh, the biomass is in good shape. It shouldn't, right? And always keep your fingers, toes, and everything you have crossed. It shouldn't result in in a reduction. But unfortunately, as as we well know, that um, the uh, Stock assessment subcommittee could find some kind of a snafu with that. We might have to take a small, a small hit. Hopefully, we don't because, you know, honestly, I think especially New Jersey, we're at a point where, uh, you know, we're we're at twelve and a half inches. A lot of other states north of us, especially, which is where we're finding the, you know, the core of this stock is New Jersey, New York. Mm -hmm. uh, in the Massachusetts, right? They, those states tend to increase their size limit. Uh, New Jersey has realized that don't increase the size limit, right? Take a, take a slight reduction. If you have to take a reduction, take a slight reduction in the number of days open because that results in less discarded fish, right? So if we can discard less fish, Bingo. then we're, we're converting those to keeper fish in the cooler rather than dead discards on the bottom of the ocean. Those don't do us any good, but we still get them counted against us. Long story short is, you know, the solution to, to taking a reduction or conserving, especially conserving fisheries, um, whether it be sea bass or scup or summer flounder, or whatever, what have you, it isn't to increase the size. It's, you know, you have to fish on, the most abundant size class yep. that you have available to you. And and that's that 12 and a half to, uh, inch fish. Well, Admiral Clark, to a person, everyone I've spoken with, over the past few years, they seem satisfied now that 12 and a half, okay, we'll live with it. And they like that you, they were able to keep it at 12 and a half for that late season fishery. Yeah. Yep. That, yeah. That, I mean, yeah. Well, honestly, even during the late season, we're seeing giant, giant <laughs> fish. But that 12 and a half, you know, we were able to run that size. I think by running 12 and a half inches throughout the entire year, you had that hit consistency where people aren't confused with the regulations. I mean, let's be honest, Tom, these regulations are pretty intricate, right? We've got four seasons. We've got three different possession limits. You know, we were, thankfully, we, we, we have a consistent size limit. And that will work. Peter, we're up against a hard break. When we get back, we're going to be talking some prime artificial reefs. These are structure-oriented fish. I want to get a word from Admiral Peter Clark. Yeah. What to really look for? I mean, you want to pick out some of the, the bigger bass, any type of specific cover. So grab that cup, grab that rebel. Be right back. Rack and Fin Radio. Then that they really, really, uh, hold on, record... Yeah. Rack and Fin Radio with Tom P. WPG Talk Radio 95.5 and the WPG Talk Radio app. Is your home ready? WPG Talk Radio 95.5. Here we go. Look out below. Back inside Rack and Fin Radio with me, Tom P. And Peter Clark, Marine Biologist, Bureau of Marine Fisheries. Talking the Sea Bass Prospectus. And we're going to be talking some of... Pete's uh, favorite artificial reefs, most productive for sea bass, as he would know, as he is the state's artificial reef coordinator. Well, Pete, one question specifically regarding the sea bass. They're, they're, we know they're a structure-oriented fish. Any particular, like tog-like tanks for whatever reason, you know, the metal. Any particular type of structure that you find over your years and the studies, whatever, that sea bass will gravitate to first prior or before selecting somewhere else, like a reef or whatever gets too crowded. What are they really, really looking for? Yeah, I mean, so I, I honestly, they're, they're looking for anything. I mean, you find a, a boulder out in the middle of an open bottom and it's going to have sea bass on wow. it. So what, what I typically do is, um, you know, if, if I've got conditions to anchor, in other words, if I've got, um, if I've got, a 
know, good current, good wind, uh, enough to hold me on a spot and not swing all over the place, then what I prefer to do is I'll find a, something with some, some good relief, you know. Um, I'll, I'll run over it. I like to check the bottom machine. If I see fish stacked on it 10 feet, 15 feet, 20 feet high, I mean, there's, there's, I've seen sea bass stacked offshore, and I kid you not, 80 feet off the bottom. I'm not, I'm, it, you know, unbelievable, just biblical amounts of sea bass around. Um, we're, we are so so fortunate to have this fishery. Right? That's what the one the one charter captain, uh, party boat captain in particular, up there at a boat range, says, Tom, I've been in this business for 30, I've never seen it like this. So, yeah. listen, listen, this augurs well for a great first portion of the season, especially. Well, Pete, now, you said any type of cover will attract a species, correct? Yeah, so listen, if if you've got a good drift, I, I love the drift form because you can cover some ground. Yep. I'll hover, you know, so I'll, I'll power what's power drifted, right? So if I find a good piece of bottom and uh, and it's low, um, you know, you, I, I fish up in the north a lot. We've got some, some lower, hard, hard bottom that you can drift over. But if it's rough out, it's a, you know, find something that's got some vertical structure to it. They're going to be on it. So anchor up. Um, you know, and, and just start working on those things. Some, a lot of times I'll power the boat across the wreck and then I'll, sw- it'll swing back on itself. And, uh, you, you know, depends on the day. You got to keep those, you got to keep that bait moving. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, obviously it's, you're not, you're not jigging for them like summer flounder, but there's gotta be, if the thing's just hanging limp, then maybe you ought to go to jigging. You've got some current, you know, and your high low rig can can have a little bit of uh, of its own natural action as you're keeping it on the bottom. Then there's a few different techniques that you've got to try on each given day. Uh, yeah. Well, Cap, you know my proclivities, as you can see my size. So I'm in the volume. I like the mm-hmm. high low rig with some fish bites on it, or clam, or even green yeah. crab. Or this is one of the most underrated, especially for bigger sea bass baits, is a live killy. Or down here in the south, we call them mini. Pete, those are deadly, but I, I like yeah, the drop. Are. I like the drop and the reel. <laughs> That's my well, deal. <laughs> yeah, and, and sea bass it should be like that. It should be dropping real fish, and if it's not, you're probably not in the right spot. Mm-hmm. Pete, now right, that so I also yeah. like squid. I'll take little squid strips, about two and a half, three inches long. I'll tip mm-hmm. them on. Um, you know, but listen, don't don't forget about jigging. Like, you know, jigging can be an absolutely deadly way to harvest some of the bigger fish on a piece. If, Cap, I'm wondering why the j- all the times I'm on the boats, again, 90% of the bigger sea bass are caught on the metals, the slow pitch, whatever, the avas, whatever. What is yeah. it with the jigs as opposed to a nice big fresh hunk of clam, for example, that they'll eschew that and go for that metal? Yeah, because these fish are territorial and they are aggressive. So those larger fish, as they see that piece of that lure working, uh, you know where they're where they're residing, they become aggressive on it and they attack it. So that's why you get those larger fish on the jigs. And you know, like you said, you put an Ava on the bottom and then a dropper loop with a you know with a gulp on the top um, or a fish bite on the top. Yeah. Some you know, unbelievable catch rates, and they're bigger fish, and not can, as many. I know, but, I know, but here's another thing too, where they could they make me pull my hair out. Sometimes with an Ava with a tube, you can't keep them off. Without a tube, they don't want it, or vice versa. I mean, they can be yeah. a little persnickety. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Yep, my, you know, and I've seen people tip that Ava as well with a little piece of squid, like you said, with the tube, without a tube. So yeah. What, what works today may not work tomorrow, so be ready to switch it up. Pete, uh, and so far as the size of the fish, harvesting like with the tog, you know, you're, you're hard to let the let the bigger ones go. I mean, say you get a five or six pound, which is a monster, five or six pound sea bass. Is that fish past its reproductive prime? Is it okay to keep that, or will you get crucified on the social whatever? What do you think? As a bio, as a biologist, yeah, my 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 vote is to take it home. I like this man. <laughs> and the reason, listen, I, look, there's what w- we're typically fishing in a little bit deeper water, especially if you're talking about a five or six pound fish. Uh, yeah, you'll you see down it, yep. them in that 40, 50 mm-hmm. foot of water. But there's a thing called barotrauma, right? So when we start getting into 80 feet of water with these fish, 
as we bring them up to up to the to the surface, and we're not bring we're bringing them up quickly. They they and you see that their belly come out of their mouth. Yeah, you know if the thing's legal, there's there's no reason to let it go. If it's not, you can vent it. You know, I'm I'm actually sitting at my desk here looking at a venting tool. We empl- we empl- employ these very very often. Uh, especially when we're offshore in November and December fishing, uh, mm-hmm. it's called Venta Fish. It's a really cool tool, and uh, there's some neat videos out there. So I always, uh, you know, I promote venting fish if you're releasing them. That way, we, we don't have floaters all over the the surface of the water. Yeah. So Pete, th- those things are uh, very effective then. Oh, uh, yeah, I've seen them. Yeah, I've seen so I many of those. The chance of survival of fish aren't even though you're sticking a hole in them. They're not uh, injured per se. Correct. Yeah, they'll heal up pretty quickly and they can get back to the bottom. Because what's happening is we're bringing, it's like a diver getting the bends, right? Mm-hmm. To get that air in their blood. So as we're bringing them up, that air has gone from a compressed state on the bottom to an expanded state on top. And they don't have enough power to get themselves back down. So by venting them, letting that air, that expanded air out of their body, they can, they can swim back down to the bottom. Pete, before we get to uh, your baby, the immensely successful and popular artificial reef program, uh, sea bass, predation on sea bass other than human. I saw a tuna open last, I guess it was last fall, September, October, whatever it was. The thing was, in fact, it was at Creekside Outfitters. Guy was weighing it in there. It was packed. I have a photo somewhere. It was packed with sea bass. I mean, yeah. they get they get hammered, don't they? Well, I, I think... Yeah, I think tunas will eat them. I think striped bass will probably eat them. Bluefish will. I, that bluefish will definitely eat them. Um, so yeah, I mean, there's def, there's there's things that are preying on them. But by and large, sea bass are one of the. They're an aggressive, aggressive predator. We find sea bass with lobsters in them, crabs in them, you know, and everything under the squid in them, and <laughs> sand needles in them. Every, they they eat. They eat. Boy, they are very aggressive. He said the eating reference. That was for my benefit. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> okay, Gabby, let us get to the successful, immensely popular artificial reef program in Jersey. Uh, deployments coming up. And uh, give me your top five pick for sea bass this portion of the season. Go! All right, so top five. Um, Atlantic City Reef has got some absolutely outstanding pieces on it. I'll probably put two of them. Um there's a caisson gate called the William Kane. There's a, this is on Atlantic City Reef, and there's, uh, oh gosh, I would say, well, yeah, the Jet Trader is a fantastic, absolutely fantastic. Tobacco Point, there's, there's three right there on AC. So let me keep going south. Um, Oof. down on Wildwood's got some great rock piles. Yeah. So I would, I would, I mean, yeah, if I was sailing into Wildwood Reef, I would be checking out those rock piles down there. Same with Townsend's and Cape May. I mean, there are some immense rock piles that we put down there about, I would say, six years ago. So they got they have growth. They have mussels growing on them. They're, they're producing. Some of my buddies down there are saying that they are definitely producing very well down there. Okay, Admiral, that's four. One more for the gold, man. One more for the, well, no, that was Townsend's Wild uh, Four Reefs. Um, okay, well, I mean, if, if any of those, the, any of the, the Garden States. Oh, are, yeah, North uh, and South, yep. Yeah, the, those, you know, and some of those aren't hit as heavily as the Barnegat Light Reef, for instance. So a little bit further travels, you're going to find some great, great, I, Tom, you know, at the end of the day, you get onto a reef, you're going to find sea bass. They are, like I yeah. said, everywhere. Well, Peter, one thing, too, of the events is you have your hardcore flounder guys want nothing to do with sea bass unless they're totally skunked. Then they'll try for them. So, pressure, for example, on the Garden State, north and south, seems to be more flukers than sea bassers. But, again, you're drifting there. Those sea bass will grab a gulp or a squid strip in a mini. I mean, you got there's no you got no break from these things. They're all over. <laughs> they are. They're, they're aggressive, yeah. Yeah, they are all over, for sure. Um, you know, look, but, you know. It, it's a it's a nice little it's a nice uh you know cherry on the pie if yeah you're well, out there. nice problem to have, have huh lot. yeah yeah Cap, no kidding yeah before i let you go now go into where people can get uh the artificial reef numbers whatever the website the the, imp- yeah. the new book what do you got 
All right, so if you Google New Jersey Artificial Reef Program, it'll first thing that'll come up is our website. Click on that, go down towards the bottom, there's a guide. You can do a full guide printout. Um, it, it, they're really cool. We just redid them a couple of years ago. We added, I think, somewhere around 2,000, 2,500 new numbers. Uh, there's also a new section where we, we put deployments we've put out. I think I'm on my third or fourth deployment for this year. We did some reef balls. Uh, we're doing uh, some ships. we got two more coming up out of, out of Virginia. I uh, just did one. Did the Carabasset. Um and put that up for Mass One River Marlin and Tuna Club. So we, we put that down uh, on Axel Carlson a couple months ago. Uh-huh. And uh man, that yeah, that was the uh that came out of New Bedford from the uh the wow. infamous Codfather story. Yeah, you know, that guy Carlos Raphael's old boat. Uh-huh. Uh one of them. So yeah, man, we've got a lot going on. We're probably on target to do about eight to eight to a dozen, you know? This year. Okay. Well, Pete, one thing, too, which seems to be ignored is just a great fishery now, especially with a drum. I shout out to Captain Bobby Cope there, full head mm-hmm. sport fishing with a drum. The Delaware Bay Reef. You don't hear much about it, Pete. That's got to be really producing by now, no? Well, so we've only done one deployment, and it's several years old. What we've got going on is there's a wind port being built up in Salem. And they've got big concrete piling cutoffs. They're about three foot by three foot, you know, in in uh, height and width. And then they're about long, five to eight feet. So we've got 17, over 1,700 of these cutoffs. And they're going to go on the Delaware Bay Reef. What yes. About? Yes. Yes. Several barge loads. Uh, so finally, it's taken a lot of work from our fishing game council, our marine fisheries council, yeah. and of course the economic development authority to put this project together. So you know, we're excited. Finally, getting a lot of material, great material, great concrete material is going to go down on that Delaware Bay site. And both, this is going to be just an incredible fishery there. Well, Captain, as we refer to him as Admiral Peter Clark, you have a great first portion of the season. And by the way, uh, lay off a little bit on the airy rugs and the doormats, man, because I know you. <laughs> I know you clean these. Things. You pound them big time on that Mad Hatter of yours. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks for having me, Tom. I appreciate hey, take it. Take care. Great job and great uh, congratulations to you, Marine Fisheries. You got a super job on the reefs and thanks for sharing this information. Great sea bass and people. Some ugly weather. Let's so go. what? Get out and go. Pete, we'll see you soon. Catch you later. Take care. Oh boy, I can't wait this week. Oh, I'll be right back. Rack and Fin Raider Sea Bass time. People all over the Jersey Shore have found the easiest way to stay connected to South Jersey's talk station. It's the WPG Talk Radio app. Read free, unlimited South Jersey news. Listen to your favorite talk shows. Send us breaking news tips and more. The WPG Talk Radio app is powered by Smokers Haven. You'll find the finest selection of cigars at any of their five locations. Stop in and let them help you find the perfect cigar to pair with your life. SmokersHavenNJ.com Fox News, I'm Chris DeMeo. Mercedes-Benz employees in Alabama voting against joining the United Auto Workers in a secret ballot election. Obviously not the result we wanted, um, but, uh, you know, these, these courageous workers reached out to us because they wanted justice. Um, they led us. They led this fight. And that's what this is all about. United Auto Workers President Sean Fain. The union was hoping to add to its string of victories after a successful union vote at the Volkswagen plant in Chattanooga and a new contract at six Daimler truck facilities. A major recall for some potentially dangerous electric ranges. Electrolux Group is recalling about 200,000 Frigidaire and Kenmore electric ranges because the heating elements can turn on by themselves or fail to turn off. America's listening to Fox News. Your WPG Talk Radio 95.5 AccuWeather forecast for South Jersey. For today, cloudy with a shower, high 67. For tonight, mostly cloudy, low 53. For tomorrow, cloudy in the morning, intervals of clouds and sunshine in the afternoon with a high of 69. 
Tomorrow night, mostly cloudy skies with a low of 50. On Monday, mostly sunny and delightful with a high of 71. Monday night, mainly clear, low 48. I'm Mackie Weathers, Kayla Lawrence on WPG Talk Radio 95.5. Rack and Fin Radio with Tom P. WPG Talk Radio 95.5. That was Peter Clark. Marine Biologist, Bureau of Marine Fisheries. He's also the Artificial Reef Coordinator. Talking sea bass, a little biology there. Some uh, some of Pete's favorite techniques and some of his picks for this portion of the sea bass season coming up. Again, he mentioned the AC Reef, and he gave you three great spots on that. The Wildwood Reef, the Townsend's Inlet Reef, too, is severely underrated why i just said that and put it out there that suck i don't believe i did that that's right the cape may reef also garden state north and garden state south and yay yay on that delaware bay reef starting to get some uh, attention paid to it in the form of deployment a little later on well pete mentioned jigging the advantages of jigging you want bigger fish insofar as sea bass you jig so there's speed jigging, there's this kind of jigging, there's that kind of jigging. What has taken everything by storing the past couple of years, the slow pitch game, slow pitch jigging, where evidently the metal, the, these jigs are they're keel weighted or something really funky looking. They resemble an injured, injured bait fish, not a fleeing bait fish. The pelagics like the fleeing bait fish, you know, and the tuna and stuff. Sea bass in particular are ripe for the plucking, employing the slow pitch technique. Join us on the line right now, very special. Guess who's on a few weeks ago? It was a great guy. Great to re- remake the acquaintance is Chris Gatley. He is a business manager for Mustad here in the Northeast, and he is one hell of a f- expert fisherman, be it fresh salt, river, lake, pond, back bay, inshore, offshore, anywhere, anywhere. We're going to talk some slow pitch techniques and some of those Mustad jigs. Taylor made for this. Hey Gatley, how you doing, man? I'm running out. Of, I'm running out of things to say about you, man. <laughs> no, it's all good. I'm doing good. Chris, the season opened up yesterday, Friday. Sea bass and it's hot. The fluke guys are going to be fluking. They're going to be doubling up on sea bass. The sea bass guys and gals are out there. But when it comes to the jigging game and getting the bigger sea bass, it seems that the slow pitch method has has no peer. Now, what are you finding out there in all your experience? Now, especially you're always seem to be on the cutting edge. I hate that term, but it's. It's a cliche because it's true. On the, the on the new techniques, especially in the saltwater game, slow pitching is that effective? Is it not? No, it totally is. I mean, there's there's you know, slow pitch is actually um, something that's been around forever. Really? Um, yeah, I mean, it's really started overseas, you know, and kind of worked its way into North America. Um, but really, I mean, the jigging is 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 pretty effective but there's a lot of nuances to it um you had mentioned in the call out in the beginning um you know rear weighted and 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 that's true there's rear weighted front weighted jigs there's center weighted jigs yeah Um, yeah yeah, and 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 they're all used for different things now um you know speed jigging like pelagic fish you take a tuna they have a you know they don't have a flat tail like a bass so they're they're speedier they're faster um whereas a sea bass has a flatter tail kind of think of like a bass, um, they're slower. Um, they're still quick, but they're slower. So that's where sl- the slow pitch actually technique actually plays a hand in better success rates. Um, now we can all argue that you could put a piece of clam on your hook or a gulp and catch just as many. He knows. He down. knows. He knows my proclivities, people too. Hey, Dally, you haven't seen me in years. You well, still know what I'm like. <laughs> no, but it just comes down to how you want to fish them, and yeah. everyone's different. So um, you know, a center weighted jig so think of like an ava jig is a perfect example where it's kind of weighted the same all throughout for the most part mm-hmm. or in that center section um that really lends a good hand for uh slow pitch because the weight is even and it kind of slices through the water if you want to work it that way um there's beveled edges on a lot of these jigs now so they can cat cut and catch water and they can deflect off um however there's times when there's bluefish on top of these sea bass. So now all that goes out the window because you don't want a slow pitch, a jig that's going back and forth, nice and even keeled when you have to get through the bluefish. So that's where a rear weighted or a front weighted jig might come in hand. So here at Mustad, we've developed lures for all these different instances. Now, granted, a lot of it's for overseas, but they all play a hand here in the Northeast and the mid-Atlantic states. Um, you know, just last 
last fall when I first got to Mustad, we did a sea bass trip with Bob Cope on the, on Full Head Sport Fishing out of Cape May. Gee, and I just I, I just mentioned Cope the drum fishing. He gets guys yeah, all over. Awesome. The, yeah, isn't he awesome? <laughs> he's he's awesome. But we were in 114 foot of water last year, last fall, and the bluefish weren't big. They were like two pounders. But the problem was you had to get through them. Mm-hmm. And we we realized that we had to get from away from these one ounce jigs, two ounce jigs, and get into three four ounce jigs. Now you're talking a longer jig, not something I necessarily want. But we had to get through those bluefish to get to the sea bass. Um, so you got to play around a little bit. Um, but in all in, in all seriousness, I mean, if I'm going to go jigging for sea bass. I want a super light rod. I want a super small reel. I want to have fun. Chris, I was just going to ask you that. It's like slow pitching. It, it, you know, spawned a whole like sub industry, like a culture industry. You see these slow pitch rods. Now these reels and you see on the packaging, you know, ideal for slow pitching. That's it's and the line. It's just, it's a phenomenon. Yeah. Well, really the whole thing with slow pitch is really, I mean, for lack of a better way of explaining it over the radio, if you put your tip on the water and then you lift your rod tip, almost vertical. I'd never go vertical, but almost vertical. And then you let the lure drop that essentially is slow pitch. And what happens is you're not speed jigging like you see on TV for tuna or amberjacks, but you're, you're lifting that rod tip up. You're letting the jig cut across the water. Let's just say to the left. And then as it's dropping, it's fluttering to the right. And then as you're working it back to the boat, you're kind of going left, right, left, right through the water column. And it's a slower presentation that it really allows these sea bass to just hammer in on it. Um, and the bigger fish, yeah. I mean, I've even at the, the night of your freshwater, saltwater, um, bigger fish tend to fall victim to jigs as opposed to other styles of bait. Now, again, we can all debate that, but that's just been my experience through the years. We're speaking with Chris Gatley, uh, Northeast Business Manager, Mustad Fishing, the slow pitch game. Well, Gatley, so you mentioned the different lengths, weights of the jigs. Will that affect the action, say, going from a one ounce to going up to a three ounce, or the action is pretty much going to be the same? Or do you work them the exact same way, a heavier jig as opposed to a lighter jig? Um, let's rule out bluefish. So there's no bluefish around. I'm, I'm a firm believer that I try to use the lightest weight, lightest jig possible to get to the bottom in a, in a, in a relatively expedient time. Um, I don't want to wait all day to get a jig to the bottom, mm-hmm. but, um, but I try to go as light as possible. So um, we, I would say that out of the Mustad lineup, the best jig probably all around, whether you're in 60 feet of water out to 115 feet of water, if you're with Bob Cope in Cape May, mm-hmm. is probably the zippy jig because we have a one ounce, a two ounce, a three ounce. Um, it, it's, it'll, it's a rear weighted jig, but you, it still will cut across. It won't glide to the left and to the right as far, but it allows you to get to the bottom relatively quickly. Um, it's a light enough jig that, <clears throat> that you can really effectively target sea bass. And, and it's just a nice, it's just a nice profile for bait fish. Um, we can make some other jigs like the Mizashi jig, but it comes with a treble hook and that changes the action dramatically. Um, you have to take that hook off to get it to really work the way that I prefer it to work. Um, but that jig only goes up to two ounces. So if you're in 40 feet of water, say North Jersey, um, that jig might come into play. Granted, you take the treble hook off. Um, so there's a lot of variations, and and I think the way I fish it versus the way you fish it versus the next person, um, there's going to be little subtle changes to the way we all fish and manipulate the jig and the rod and the action and the way we jig that you might find something better in this lineup as opposed to me finding it over here in the zippy jig. Okay, Chris, we're up against a hard break here. Thanks for coming on. Uh, a couple more questions. One. In all your years doing this, very successful fisherman, have you noticed when it comes to the sea bass, maybe water, temperature, depth, what have you, color makes a difference to the jig? Um, certain days, I, I honestly, I think you just got to get it down there. Now, <laughs> granted, if I'm in, if I'm in way up north, um, like Cape Cod, I'll go more greens because of of. This, the, the tinker mackerels and stuff like that. Okay, there you go. Down here's blues and stuff, pinks. I love pink. Because I, I walked in, what was it, the real seat, fisherman supply, I look at the wall, I got mud up a la mud on. Look at all these, how, oh, do you, how, do you, how do you make a choice? 
<laughs> all the shops have it. You really, you really just have to take a look at the jig, and you can see, you can see if there's more weight towards the top or the bottom, mm-hmm. or if it's pretty even keel. That's a center weighted jig. Um, center weighted jigs are awesome until the bluefish show up. <laughs> the blues, yeah. Well. I don't know. It's just it's this this jigging game just just gets me. I enjoy doing it. I'm not good at it. Still try it. But Gatley, again, you know my proclivities when it comes down to it. Hey man, we have half hour left before we're going in. Okay, where's the high low rig and the clam? <laughs> that's but that's effective that's, too. Yeah, that's just my well, game. If you're just if you're just looking to fill up a cooler and you're on a party boat, I mean <laughs> that's effective. That's it. Chris, give that mustad website, please. It's mustadfishing.com. This is great selection of the jigs. Check them out. Chris, thanks for joining us, and I'm sure you're going to be on the road again somewhere. How's your schedule look? <laughs> Pretty light, actually, right now. Oh, um, that's a minute. You're going to get to go fishing? Yeah. Yeah, I just put the new live scope on my boat, so we're going to check that out maybe today, probably tomorrow. Okay, Chris, thanks much for joining us, and have a great season. Uh, looking forward to have you back again on Rack and Fin. Take care, bro. You got it. Thank you, sir. See you, man. Is a great guy, an incredible fisherman, and just he just likes to fish and likes to educate people. Likes to teach. It's just one of the one of the best out there. Okay, man, be right back. Rack and Fin Radio. Rack and Fin Radio with Tom P. WPG Talk Radio ninety five point five South Jersey's talk station. Today. One in five working age Americans has a mental health condition. People in all types of jobs and at all levels. And the key to helping us succeed is a supportive and inclusive workplace. All of us have a role to play in making that happen. So what can I do to help? As a CEO, I can set the tone for supportive culture. As a manager, I can offer assistance and accommodations. As a coworker, I can listen and be a source of support to my colleagues. As someone with a mental health condition, I can ask for what I need to perform my best. I can offer all employees the supports they need to deliver on the job. For the team and for the business. What can I do? What can I do? What can I do? I can remind others that we all benefit from workplaces that promote good mental health. Mental health friendly workplaces are more important than ever. And all of us have a role to play in promoting them. Learn more at whatcanyoudocampaign.org. Where will you be when disaster strikes? This is County Executive Denny Levinson. Consider becoming a volunteer disaster response crisis counselor to assist individuals and communities in their time of need. Be part of the emergency response network. No clinical background is required. Receive 22 hours of state-certified training to help educate, support, and inform those impacted. Call 609-645-7700, extension 4519, to learn more. This is South Jersey's talk station, WPG Talk Radio 95.5. Hey, welcome back to our final segment, Rack and Fin Radio with me, Tom P. Weekend of May 18th and 19th. I just want to wrap it up with a couple of tournament announcements. Uh, June 1st and 2nd is the fifth annual Raging Raymond Fluke Tournament. We're going to be held there at a Mystic. Uh, let's see. Captain's meeting is on May 31st. It's going to be uh, June 1st and 2nd. I say Captain's meeting May 31st at 7 p.m. at the American Legion Post 493. 420 Radio Road in Little Lake Harbor, a.k.a. Mystic Island. Entry fee is 100 per boat for four anglers. Fish Sunrise Saturday through Sunday at 1 p.m. For more info, give a call 609-845-7653. And also June 2nd of Sunday, the Nuncy Bruno Kids Bluefish Tournament. Nuncy, a chest on that boat. You are Nuncy and Ann Bruno. Miss them both. Their daughters, Mary Ann and Violet. Known them since they were little, little kids. Uh, they are running it successfully now. It's, pre- it's presented by the Obsequian Saltwater Sportsman Club from 7 a.m. to noon with weigh-in until 1 p.m. at Chestnut Neck Boatyard in Port Republic. Sign up at Chestnut Neck. And I understand they added several other fish in there with the paucity of bluefish. All those blues seem to be running around everywhere. They got a press release. A longtime acquaintance in, in the fishing tackle industry. And I've fished this tournament a couple of times way back, way back when it started it's a 23rd annual Manhattan Cup Warrior Striper Tournament. It's going to be June 9th. It's going to be held up there out of uh, New York City. And I'm reading through the release. I said, yeah, this reading. And I it came upon, I said, whoa. This was, uh, I had to put a call into, um, again, longtime acquaintance. Uh, Gary Caputi, 40 years, a super successful fishing photojournalist. 
had a great book out in the early 90s, Fishing for Stripers. And except for the, the references to Loran and some water line, man, it is still it is still one of the finest, most comprehensive books on catching line ciders. Gary's on the line right now to t- uh, tell us uh, briefly about this tournament. Wish I had more time. Uh, no Frankie Crescitelli. Captain Frank Crescitelli is, is involved with this. Um, one of the guys who started. Gary's involved with it. John DePersonaire, formerly of the RFA, now with uh, Viking Yachts. For a great cause. And um, when, I got th- when I read through this and saw the name Raguso and then what happened, uh, Gary can uh, brief us on our... If you know any veterans, I know they're getting pretty jammed there. As Gary will explain, you know any veterans who who, who want to go fishing? You know, this this is a, an amazing, amazing tournament. Granted, it's up there in New York, sort of out of listening, Rackenville Radio listening range, terrestrial radio. However, they have people coming in from California for this. Uh, Gary, sorry, I got a little winded on that, cutting into your time. But um, tell us about this uh, Manhattan Cup. By the way, great book. Yes. I just referenced it the other night again. <laughs> 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 yeah, it was uh, it was quite a, a, a seller in its day, but um, yeah, it's still around, but uh, it hasn't been in print for quite a while. At any rate, let's get on to the tournament. Um, mm-hmm. This is the 23rd Manhattan Cup, and the Manhattan Cup it was started to honor the first responders after 9/11, right, um, guys right. who were you know severely impacted, PTSD, the whole nine yards. Um, and after the first 10 years or so, it started to transition into working with warriors coming back from Iraq and Afghanistan, guys with visible wounds, invisible wounds. Um, and it's become a real calling. Um, it's not held in New York City. It's held out of the Liberty Lane Liberty Arena Lander, yeah. and Liberty House Restaurant. And those are in Jersey City, actually in Liberty State Park. Park. It's a beautiful place. It's right across the river from the Freedom Tower, there you go. Not yep. where the uh, where the Twin Towers came down. And last year we set a record. We had fifty two vets come and fish with us. Um, a while back, the Veterans Administration sent out a very um, disturbing um, statistic. They said that on average, twenty two recent vets were killing themselves, were committing suicide <sighs> daily. And that's when we went to, uh, we started our initiative called Catch 22. It was originally to have at least 22 guys fishing with us on that day. So we know they're all right. Since then, it, we never we never stopped at 22. Like I said, this year it was 52. Last year, 52. Next year is probably going to be even more for this coming June. Mm-hmm. Um, you can enter this as a in the sportsman's division, which is you bring your own boat, you bring your own team, you fish, you spend the day with all of these wonderful American heroes. It has a we start with a buffet breakfast in the Liberty House restaurant, and then from there. Um, out fishing, we have the New York uh, Fire Department brings out one of their fire ship uh, fire boats and does a water display as we come down and we do a shotgun start in front of the Statue of Liberty. Fish all day, come back by three o'clock to the marina, walk back to the restaurant, couple hours of open bar, hobnob with all the vets. They mm-hmm. love it, um, and it's a wonderful, wonderful experience. It changes everybody who ever attends. Not just the vets, the people that come to honor the vets, the people that come to support them. Um, our goal had always been to get as many vets on the water for the day as we possibly could. Mm-hmm. But it's also become a fundraiser. And as a result, two years ago, we started our own foundation called the Fin Chasers Warriors Outdoors. And it's been doing great work Beautiful. with warriors throughout the season. Um, guys who are in the dark places, we get them out fishing. Um, we have so much going on that there's way too much to cover in a short period of time. But... If you'd like to learn more or if you'd like to bring your boat, go to www.manhattancup.com. All the information is there. You can sign up. I have to give a big shout out to so far 28 charter captain and light tackle guides who have donated their time, their boats, the fuel, and their mates to take guys out fishing on this special day. Um, And also we have phenomenal sponsors, awesome auctions, live auctions. We've got charters from 
four of the Wicked Tuna Boats, including um, Pinwheel. Tyler McLaughlin is actually going to be there with his sister. And um, I'm a Marciano fan. Man. I'm a Marciano fan myself. Goombad, you understand? <laughs> he donated trips on his boat there a number of times. Gary, before Good I let guy. you go, we're up against a break here. Uh, listeners, anglers can compete in any of three categories, fly, artificial lure, or bait, live or dead, with trophies bred in each category. But Gary, before I let you go... Um, when I read here about Master Sergeant Chris Ragusa, I've known his dad, John, for many years. I never had the opportunity to know Chris. It was just trash when I read this. When, when Actually, when you yeah. told me about it. Can you go into that briefly? Yeah. Chris Ragusa was a Master Sergeant in a very elite um, helicopter rescue squad. Um, now he, he was... Um, Air National Guard, and he had been called up to serve in Af uh, Afghanistan. He got called up again in Iraq. He got called up mm -hmm. to um, work most recently in the um, Operation Inherent Resolve, which was to wipe out ISIS in Syria. And he was killed in action. Um, he left behind a wife <sighs> and two little girls. He was a decorated New York Fire Department lieutenant. Right. He was decorated by the um, uh, by Congress. Phenomenal guy. His father, John Raguso, has been a writer for the Fisherman magazines for probably 30 years. Um, mm -hmm. We named the trophy um, that goes to the warrior that catches the largest striped bass during the tournament, the Chris J. Raguso Memorial Award. And his dad usually attends each year. It's, uh, it's really a... Um, a heartfelt way to honor somebody who was really an American hero. He was. Gary, great work here. Uh, Captain Frank Crescitelli, John, the person here, Gary, and everyone involved, and uh, Mike Dean. Let's just go to ManhattanCup.com if you want to uh, participate. Or, Gary, again, is it open? Can, can someone... Uh, or recommend a, a vet. Is it, how how can a veteran get involved with this? If you go go to the website, there's contact information for a variety of people. You want to talk? If you want to have a vet that would like to come, who you feel could help. Most of the vets are um, um, suffering from PTSD and physical. Um, disabilities but the guy is um robert gill he's our warrior liaison his number's on the website and um robert is a um was a sergeant and he was critically wounded in iraq um saving his uh saving his entire platoon and um he came back from very dark places and he has been working with us now for the last eight years and oh. he is an inspiration Gary, thanks much. Listen, I'm putting it out there right now. There will be a rematch on Farrington Lake, Fat Tom P and Cool <laughs> Gary C. We will get there. Well, and, is this uh, going to be the 50th anniversary <laughs> rematch? Gary, take care. Great work. Best of Frankie and John, everybody. We'll see you soon, man. Thank you. Thanks, Tom. Take care. I, I saw, I remember seeing a photo of John, uh, or Christopher rather, John Raguso, so a little, little kid in a boat, five or six, holding up a fluke or something. I just read tragic. Okay, God bless America, God bless the troops, God bless our first responders. Yes. Uh, see you next week. Rack and Finn Radio.